Hey, Phil, have you heard? What's that? About the bird? Bird, 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 bird is the word. Bird, bird, bird. <laughs> Next on Eternal Dirtles. Hey, I just want to give a quick shout out to all of our Patreon supporters out there. Thank you to the Dirtle Maniacs. If you want to be a Dirtle Maniac, go to patreon.com slash eternal dirtles and help support the channel. It keeps things going. It keeps things updated. Thanks so much for watching. On with the show. Hello and welcome to Eternal Dirtles. I'm your host, Zach Clark, and with me as always, Phil Blackman. Phil, how's it going, man? Zach, I have tested, uh, limited testing, but I have tested Curse of the Filch Falcon, and uh, I'm sold, man. Yeah, well, li- sold. But limited testing. You mean you tested a constructed legacy deck in a small amount of a way. Not You didn't play 40-card decks, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, I played it in legacy. Yeah. I've, I've only got so much testing so far, but... Uh, I am sold. Boy, am I sold. Well, tell me about uh, it, man. It's it's not it's not going to upend the format or anything. It's still all, you know in my tier nine deck or whatever. But uh, yeah, dude. Like I, I if it, what, what I've learned about Case of the Filch Falcon. A, I lost a, a bunch with it because I was learning like the timing of that card. Uh, a lot of weird timing things when it comes to clues and cases. <laughs> I learned. Let's talk about I learned, the, the card itself first, too, uh, so people know. You know, we've got it over here, but if you're listening on podcast, you probably don't know what Curse of the Case of the Filch Falcon is, right? Yeah, so it's a blue enchantment. It's a case. It, the ETB on it, it uh, when you so you cast it for blue, it ETBs, it makes a clue. And then when you have Metal Craft, you get to solve it at the end of your turn. We'll get into that. And then uh, solving it lets you pay two and a blue and sacrifice it to animate a non-creature artifact and make it a 4-4 bird by putting four plus one plus one counters on it. So uh, so it's a zero, zero creature with four plus one plus one counters on it, but it's a flying bird. Okay. And so what I, I learned in testing is uh, clues are not the easiest thing to play with when timing of when you draw cards matters, but there is some cool things that arise from that sort of sequencing. So the first thing I learned about Case of the Filch Falcon in particular, in any case that anybody plays, I've seen like some modern Storm Bros playing like case of the ransacked lab which is just you know a goblin electromancer variant that then when you solve the case you get to like copy your spells okay but solving a case so like when you fulfill the condition to solve the case it does not solve until your end step so that actually cost me a turn cycle in practice as i was testing the card because i thought i could end step deduce get metal craft and then solve the case oh okay and you you cannot do that so uh, you can o- the co- the case can only be solved in your end step. I thought I could do it in my opponent's end step. Uh, you know, end of turn, solve the case, crack it, make a four four flyer, untap, attack the four. That's not how it works. Yeah. So in, in in that regard, you know, you can do it, but you can't surprise solve the. So case. how does your deck get metalcraft? You're a miracles deck. Yeah, so you play all of the cases, and you play all of the deduces, and then I was teching some other artifacts like. Uh, Lembus, which is from your set of Lord of yeah. the Rings, which is a two-man artifact that ETB scry one draws a card, and then you can sack it uh, for two to gain three life because it's a food, yeah. and then it shuffles back into your deck. Uh, that one was fine. Really, like, it was critical to have life gain, but it could have been anything. But it was an artifact, hence my choice for it to uh, join the metal craft shenanigans. But there are other artifacts that I'm also interested in trying. A, uh, some of it being additional cards that make clues, and then also things like engineered explosives and you know other just like generically good artifacts that you might play otherwise. You're you're uh, like you're so like one out. step away from from saga miracles. I can smell it. I'm trying to figure <laughs> out what the actual correct number is. Granted, like you know, if you actually wanted to play a, a, this kind of control deck, it's arguable that you should just be playing Urza Saga and cutting all of the cards that I like to play. Right, like Urza Saga is just individually more powerful than anything I'm doing. But the the case for the case is uh, that between deduce and case uh, or and case of the Phillips Falcon, there's a high enough density of uh, artifact just incidental that it's good. I mean, the baseline for these cards is that you cast them and they draw a card, yeah. right? Which we talked about on the last episode is just being quite good. So what I found in practice was like, yes, there were times where I didn't have metal craft and that's probably just a deck building concession on like first draft. Like I didn't have, you know, enough, you know, of what I needed or whatever. Uh, but then there's also the uh, times where like you just have 
multiple cases and then you get metal crafter really quick and now you're just sitting on instant speed four force and the value of the clues when they are you know animated is that uh clues don't require tapping to sacrifice so if your opponent opponent puts a removal spell at it you can sack it in response draw a card and now you're up in that exchange now they ended up getting the mana off of your case but you know i more often than not you've cracked the case when it is reasonable enough to to do that in a more developed game state so the actual text of what Case of the Village Falcon looks like for me is it's a four mana instant speed flying four four that draws a card, but you get to pay in installments of one and three rather than paying four. Okay. Uh, and if we if you think about how like paying in installments is good, the difference between getting a paying for a one mana spell and then three mana later on as opposed to a four mana spell is the difference between you playing the game and having a card rotting in your hand it's it's funny that you mention it that way because what it sounds like you're talking about is echo which everyone hates (laughs) yeah but echo echo is just to not lose your investment of course where cards these days pay you back on the on the front half so I, like the the more and more we get to like a, a faster, a, like a faster and faster legacy. Like legacy is only getting faster as more powerful cards enter the format. And what I have found as I've tested, I mean, you can tell me if this is something that you found too. And I'm sure like anybody who's listening will also have a take on this. Is that I found that as the format speeds up, because just like the redundancy of that speed. The easiest example is just like Delver plus Dragon Rage Channel or plus, you know, whatever additional threat, whether it's Stalactite, Stalker or whatever, that you're going to have three power beaters on turn one that do other things pretty consistently always. Urza Saga itself is 20 power plus a tutor for free at instant speed. And then the uh, additional decks of like any of the Ancient Tomb decks that are on broadside bombardiers now, I mean, that deck kills you pretty much the second that thing hits the table, yeah. right? So... The the fact that the format has sped up across all of these decks, and then of course combo is fast. That along along with that comes the need for control decks that want to keep up to also compress. And so we've seen the Beanstalk decks be able to keep up just because Beanstalk itself is a one mana or as a well, one card engine that's cheap that also replaces itself that lets all of your free interaction and one mana interaction also draw a card that lets you keep up on resources while not while also keeping your curve relatively low so if you actually look at like the beanstalk decks and i know everybody's trying out those again now that triumph of saint catherine is on moto so i get that all of their cards are are expensive cmcs but really they're all cheap right the the end their curve ends at like two it's Merktide Regent, which costs two. It's in uh, ca- uh, Triumph of St. Catherine, which in you know the proper board state should cost two. Force of Will is free. The Leyline Binding should cost one. You know everything else in the deck costs one outside of Beanstalk that costs two. Maybe you have some flex slots also like Witherbloom Command or whatever. But like the curve does not go higher than two, yeah. unless you're playing unless you're making some concession and playing like Narset or some other Planeswalker or something, right? Which is a meta game choice, not a part of the shell. And so the more I was looking at how. Every other deck that isn't one of those like linear decks that are just trying to get the game over as fast as possible. I was thinking to myself, yeah, okay, so everything else needs to come down too. And I was noticing that the all of my win conditions that I was playing, whether it's Jace or Entreat or anything else from 2017, uh, but even like the the stuff that's replacing that stuff. So even like the decks that are still playing Uro, which, you know, again, Uro pay you pay it for it in installments, right? Like yeah. that's a good analogy. You pay three up front, you get paid off for that, and then you get the back end of it. It's not a seven mana spell; it's a three and a four mana spell that gives you it, the progression along the way. Uh, I guess you could even say that it's a six mana spell because it pays you back for the first land and then uh, to to get to the next stage. Anyway, so all those expensive cards, whether you know they're Narset to Fairy, Jace the Mind Sculptor, Entreat the Angels, what have you, all of that stuff, I would find are in those positions that I call 10 twos, which is what we talked about last yep. episode, where it's like, you know, they're, they're either they're bangers or they suck and rot in your hand to do nothing, right? So, like, obviously all those cards are good against the decks that, you know, want to grind and go long, but against the decks that aren't interested in that, they are more likely to be blank than they are to actually have relevant text. So, or you just, like, you know, end up casting your Teferi, cycling it to try and bide for time, they kill it, and then you're still on the back foot. Same thing with Narset. And then Entreat would, you know, you never get off. Or uh, Fourth Aerolingus, unless you're pay- playing Lotus Petal Ancient Tomb, you're never actually converting that, like, until you've already won the game anyway. So 
what case of the Felix Falcon did for me was it gave me a win condition that al- that joined the compression of the format. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, you yeah, know, right. that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. You know, it's funny uh, because we were talking last week about uh, uh, about um, what cryptic coat. Is that what it's called? Cryptic coat. Cryptic coat, yeah. Uh, and and uh, you just mentioned Oro, and I've seen people starting to use Cryptic coat and Oro together just so they can just get around. Like it's like oh, I'll pay five for my Oro in installments, like you're talking about, and now you have a seven six unblockable beater uh, that can end the game. It, it's interesting to see what these new cards are kind of unlocking as far as strategies are concerned. Yeah, I think that it's just the first time. I, I, like we've talked a bunch about how the format has sped up, but you know, in ways that, at least on my like on your end, it's like you went you moved away from eight cast towards infect in competitive environments, and that you know, even though maybe not directly uh, an assessment of like oh I just need to be faster, that was the decision like inherently yeah. part of it that that was made right you know like it, it, it same thing on on my side except I never actually had that route other than, okay, what cards can I just play that have lower CMCs? But case of the Filch Stalken is the first time where I'm like, oh, I have a now I have a one mana win condition that can play around like with my synergies of Terminus. Because other times win conditions would just get swept up by Terminus and that would suck. Like there's some tension between Triumph of St. Catherine and Terminus. And even though they're enabled by the same things, they don't want to see each other at the same time. Well- like you only want to see terminus then triumph, not the other way around, and that it can be difficult to manage because it can be awkward. It's it is funny you mentioned the, the like my my take on like what what is ostensibly already a fast deck, right? Like eight cast, and then I switch up to a even faster deck, in fact. And honestly, the reason the reason that I made that change is because that that deck is such eight eight cast was such a threat in the format. You know, it was it was super fast. It increase the speed of the format um, that people figured out ways to beat it. You know, they, they were like, okay, like if I'm going to have to deal with this deck that is just going to destroy me, I'm going to have to make it so that my sideboard just destroys this deck in one card, right? For one mana, for one card game over. Right. And so what I basically decided was that I'm going to pivot past the answers for what the problem, you know, the problem was my deck, right? The answers were, uh, sideboard cards. I decided that those were the problem, and then I decided I'm going to go go all the way back to playing a deck that you know technically should be bad because Orcish Bowmasters exists, is what everybody says. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm playing on the same axis as everybody else because you need that you need the mana to actually have to kill the creatures, and I'm playing with this unfair card, Legolas's Quick Reflexes, to to like kind of bring my advantage back to being uh, at least level with these decks. So it's funny because you're, you're right. The speed of the format is, is now dictating, you know, things that you wouldn't even think initially that it would, that it would affect Cause you, you don't look at the, those two decks and that decision that I made and say, Oh, that's the speed of the format thing, but it, it truly is. Yeah. I think also there's inherently on the ACAST side of things that like your fast draws were with, if you opened an Urza saga, if you opened you know, uh, 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 one of the eight cash draws or like an Emery draw that, that draw isn't necessarily fast. Yeah. You may, you may end up having, you know, uh, unbeatable amounts of resources, but it's not necessarily closing the game fast where Urza Saga was really the only extent that you could go fast. And we saw that the progression of that deck all the way to the point where like, you don't see it that much anymore, but eventually they made their way over to patchwork automaton from what it used to be. Right. Like they moved into patchwork automaton cause they were like, we just need to be faster. Yeah. And I feel like, so like every deck sort of had access to these ways to be faster than they already were or more consistently uh, having those kinds of aggressive draws than they were before, uh, unless you were exactly Beanstalk. Yeah. And, and that's but, because like, of you weren't bean, you know? <laughs> uh, and if, if you weren't, if yeah, if you weren't Beanstalk control that had some way to stabilize on the back of trying to save cash and, and then also have this one minute, this one minute, this one card engine yeah. that your entire deck is built around, like there aren't any other control decks that really could exist in the competitive space. A, because they would just get entirely bodied by the Beanstalk decks themselves. But then we also saw before when people didn't have access to Triumph of St. Catherine, and even partially when they did, I mean, for the most part, it was only because they didn't have time to test it. But when people were moving over to the Soul Type Beanstalk deck, right, that deck was just trying to become a slightly bigger, uh, effectively a Delver variant where there are a a mana denial 
between Wastelands and Stifles, but then they still packed the Orcish Bowmaster, but instead of the one mana spells, they just, you know, played uh, additional removal and then buried everybody on the back of a protected Murktide. Yeah. So the, 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 that, that shell of it can still be fast, effectively the same because a Murktide can still come down on turn three with backup and kill in a swing. And like no, no deck was just looking to go all the way deep yeah. into the end game. Like, and, and by end game, I mean like where, you know, the, the, the game has effectively like reset and we're like reloading or finding ways to reload. Uh, so I don't want to, I, I don't want to disparage daybreak games, uh, you know, taking, you know, it's not, it's really not their fault that, uh, 40k isn't on magic online and it is coming. Uh, you know, they just announced that, but do you think that it's out now? It's out now. What's up? It's on, it's now. on now. Perfect. Uh, they, so the, yeah. now, now those cards are on, but do you think that will have an effect? It'll definitely have an effect on the online meta, but now as we begin to merge, into one meta again do you think that'll that, that'll have any effect on the meta as a whole like the paper meta yes. and the online meta together it's almost the same now 100%. it will 100 percent have an effect i think because all of the data that people are that primarily people look at in order to make informed decisions on deck building if they're not personally testing themselves in meaningful ways in paper, because if you're testing online, you only have access to the cards that were online. So I think Triumph of St. Catherine like, showed up very minimally by comparison to what it would had it been on Moto well before like Eternal yeah. Weekend. And then I think it did exceptionally well at Eternal Weekend, primarily because people, people were not for preparing their deck. Right, because you never faced it yeah. in, in your online testing. So if you if you did do that, you had to like calibrate, okay, like, how many sideboard slots do I play against this thing that I'm otherwise not going to be able to test against? Yeah. And then similarly, if you were trying to play Triumph of St. Catherine, you couldn't do it online. So you had to play, you know, some kind of alternative. So you'd play like Uro or something, but then it's not you're working with your the practice and your play well, patterns, you know? Yeah, your practice, your play patterns, your 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 practice is all with different cards. Yeah. So then to shift over in paper and be like, okay, let me just try and do this new thing in an event that matters that you care about, like that's that's a tough call to make. And so I think that once Triumph of St. Catherine hits Moto, we're going to, like, or now that it has hit Moto, we'll see more people actually testing with and against it. And then we'll see people have ways that they expect to combat it because they know that they're, they, they can expect to play against it. And I think we saw some of that in paper after North American Eternal Weekend and when mm -hmm that deck won and then everybody was just replicating that but then what took over was sultai beanstalk now primarily that's because sultai beanstalk was a, an effective way to beat up on the the four color beans deck because it had access to wasteland and maintained the rest of the engine whereas like it got rid of leyline binding moved into mana denial and who knew that when you move into <laughs> the days wasteland shell that that's just going to be the better option we've never had any any uh historical relevance for that right <laughs> yeah. like there's there's never been anything in history that's shown us that when you move a package into today's wasteland, it just it's, is better than whatever the original version was. It's interesting to me that, you know, the deck that's probably the worst against against a St. Catherine deck is the deck that was played the most is Delver. Like, St. Catherine beats Delver. Like, that's the whole idea, right? Um, and it, it's funny to me that, that that's the deck that was probably the most well-represented out of all... For all it, it was the most represented, let's be honest, for the entirety of all three Eternal Weekends. Um, and only by North America did we really see Triumph, like, you know, kind of cross the, cross the border, as it were. Eternal Dirtles is proud to be sponsored by Moxfield. Moxfield is the best Magic the Gathering deck building website on the internet. You can create, share, and find decks from Commander to Legacy and even fan supported formats like pre modern and old school. You can see all of our decks. On our mox field, follow the links below to stay tuned. I think it's also the fact that, like, if you're playing against, like, when you're playing, when you're on Delver and you're playing against a uh, Triumph of St. Catherine deck, you also are thinking to yourself, okay, that's the one card that I can't let resolve. And so you just don't fight over anything else yeah. because that's the only critical thing that matters. And otherwise, Delver gets to d dictate the rules by which the game is played, yeah. right? Like, that's how. That's why the deck has been the best for you know its existence, because it is the it has the most compressed curve and it has the most efficient denial and its curve its its mana cost like you know across its entire deck is what point seven yeah something maybe like less that. than that yeah. so something like that 
So, you know, if, if they think, okay, what's the critical spell that I need to care about? Or what's, you know, what's the timing of my wastelands or my days is that I actually need to ensure that I care about this outside of like, you know, a lethal swing. Okay. I'll just like not cast my forces until they try and put a triumph of St. Catherine on a stack, because if they do that, they're going to do it at sorcery speed during their draw step. Or if they brainstorm on end step with mana up, like I can navigate that position mana wise to under, to make sure that they can't do that and still play around days. Yeah. So it's like, maybe I just don't blanket throw my wasteland out there. You can think about like those timing maneuvers because trying to miracle a triumph is not uh, like a, a super easy endeavor. Yeah, no, it's either it's, it, it's a turn three maneuver, right? Or it's a three mana maneuver one way or the other. Like you're either, whoops, I got lucky and flipped it on turn three when I have this, the, the land, the, the second land in play during my draw step. Or, you know, you set it up with, with a brainstorm or a ponder. You, I mean, yeah, occasionally you're going to just like, whoa, look at that. You know, it's almost a surprise yeah, you know, when you miracle it sometimes. There, there's also something to be said that like the Sultai Beanstalk deck and like a bunch of these other decks that are starting to tech Stifle again. Uh, I mean, Stifle also can hit the Miracle Trigger and strand the Triumph of St. Catherine in hand. So it's like if they needed an early Triumph to try and stabilize and you just counter it with a Stifle, that's effectively a blank in their hand. That's like they cast Stone Swords Mystic, you like said, okay, they put Cauldron in their hand and you killed the Stoneforge Mystic and now that Cauldron is just a dead yeah. card because the game will end before they get there. And even if they do get there, you just fly overhead anyway. So, like, I, I, I don't think that Triumph is, like, the end-all be-all against these decks. It's obviously very good, but it was way, way better in the era of Expressive Iteration than it was in the era of Bowmaster. Yeah. Like, the, the, the difference between the cards that you have and access to black, there's a lot of answers that can solve Triumph of St. Catherine. And, like, the second that they want to solve that in a way that's really efficient, you can bring in your snuff outs and a surgical and catch up. It's also you know? funny to or, me that like snuff out has become the default like black removal spell. And if you look back to, you know, I guess even during express iteration, it's, it's been the black default spell, but you go back a little bit further and it was, and it was um, fatal push, but then you get cards like Merktide Regent and and well and triumph right like and you're not using cards like that anymore because they just don't hit right yeah i mean i i think the second that th th there are so many ways to mess up somebody trying to miracle and i know from having <laughs> been Anybody doing knows. that for my entire life that like one thing that i see and it, it's something that i notice a, a whole lot and i get that i'm like a mystic sanctuary gamer but i find a lot of people when they play against my variation of miracles, which has enough of a crossover if you're trying to like stop miracle mechanics specifically. Every single Delver opponent I ever play against always boards in surgical. Always. And whether or not like that is correct or whether or not it's ever timed correctly, if that's just like a natural inclination in sideboard mapping of like, okay, we have space, we can board in surgicals, then like that's also the the out to triumph right like if it ever resolves you can unholy heat it and then catch it with a surgical uh, out of the graveyard and yes you spent two cards but you spent one mana to their miracle two mana and you which is effectively just forcing yeah. it right if if you think about it in, in in a similar way or you could just force it and then surgical it also uh the other thing that you could do is if you force one and it's in the yard, and then they miracle one later with the miracle trigger on the stack. You can surgical it, surgical the first one, because technically the miracle happens in their hand. Oh yeah, You're so right. even though the trigger yeah, technically stack, the miracle is, is, is you've drawn it. Yeah. Old, olden days, olden old boomers will remember the days of miracling and entreat, and somebody vendillion clicking in response, putting it on the bottom of your deck, and then there's no entreat to actually miracle yeah. anymore. Oh, I remember that. So the good old if, days. If you just if you just condense that by 14 mana, then you get to a similar space. <laughs> yeah, you know basically. What I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was the play to make back in the day when I was playing Merfolk and and uh you know Miracles was was the deck to play. You know, people were uh doing the, the rest in peace energy field thing and they'd be like, Okay, I just sit behind this wall until I get to do my thing. Um and then they cast and treat, you know, and you're like, well, I got to get rid of that with a Vendillion click. Yeah, you know? now, I, I, I do want to point out, don't get me wrong. I, I This is not like ra totally ragging on Triumph. I still think Triumph is excellent. It's just it, it, it is not the end all be all threat that it was yeah. during the expressive iteration days. Like when expressive iteration was around and the Delver decks and like 
They didn't have Bowmaster yet. They didn't have access to anything other than Unholy Heat to remove it or Double Bolt to remove it. In, in that space where the decks are just trying to get you dead and didn't have any prison pieces, like their end game were, okay, I will take a turn off to Mystic Sanctuary back my expressive iteration to reload. It's very different than what the decks look like now, which are Bowmaster is Flame Rift at, mi at minimum, right? Merktide is a one shot. Like there are no longer like quote, quote, turns off. Yeah. Like, like reprieves of turns where it, expressive iteration, it's like, okay, if you expressive Mystic Sanctuary expressive, like, yes, you're reloading on cards, but those are turn cycles where your life total wasn't necessarily under immense yeah. pressure. Where when that's replaced with Bowmaster, your life total is always under immense pressure. And so in that regard, like Triumph is still like a reasonable tool. It's not just the insane lights out always the way that it used to be. Um, now, I don't know how many other people other than me were like really <laughs> deep into Triumph of St. Catherine. I know that there were a bunch of people who were like on Triumph out of the board and like breakfast at the time when initiative was still yeah. around. But, you know, like, like that, that was a whole different metagame, like entirely different. We had approached it differently. Uh, but what I think is cool about uh, Filch Falcon is that it fills a similar space with while also getting the curve down, right? Like, and I, I think that there are. It, this is just the one example, but it's gotten me thinking like, okay, what are the other actual legitimate win conditions that these decks that aren't just Beanstalk decks or Delver decks or Ancient Tomb decks, if there is space for anything else in the metagame, I feel like it's got to look for that stuff because those are the pillars by which you are compressed, yeah. right? Like if, if, if you can't beat, if you can't somehow deal with a Beanstalk in uh, a meaningful exchange of like maintaining card parity, you will just get buried by it by itself. If you can't keep up with an Urza Saga or an Ancient Tomb deck, like it will bury you by itself. If you can't beat Day's Wasteland, then that shell just will go under you and you'll never actually get time to get off the floor. So these are like the, the pillars that – and then, you know, obviously you have to just deal with Dark Ritual and Reanimator or whatever. But those are like – you need specific tools for that shit. So if you're going into a metagame at large and you're looking at these pillars and thinking, okay, how do I combat these pillars if I'm not in one of them, then – that's that that is the the topic of where I have found Filch Falcon is the the closest example I've gotten to. Okay, this maybe could be a thing. Now, don't get, no, I'm not saying that Filch Falcon is the pillar. I'm playing the, the the actual shell that I'm playing is Mixed Sanctuary Counterbalance to effectively keep up because I'm locking those decks out of the game. Uh, but if you just moved it over to being Beanstalk or a Days Wasteland shell, you can move the pillars around. But in terms of like how we navigate against those pillars, like if you wanted to come in rogue and you're not in that space, Filch Falcon for me is a really cool example of that, that I can't recall anything else like it in a long time, but it's gotten my brain thinking. And we, I wanted to come on and do this episode and be like, yeah. hey, listeners, if you don't want to play in one of those pillars either, then I think that the it, it's not the, the tools to fight those pillars are there, yeah. right? Like if you want to fight Delver, like Triumph is a good way to do it, but what are you doing to support it? If you want to beat up on uh, uh, Beanstalk, like you can do it. All you have to do is somehow be really effective at getting their engine offline, and then they, they're all of their cards are just clunky Tarmogoyfs that you can deal with otherwise. If you want to shut off Ancient Tomb, everybody tells me that Wasteland is a really good way to do yeah. it. Uh, I mean, there, there are options, but I think that if people start looking at, okay, what are the win conditions that aren't looked at that maybe could live in that space of a really compressed format uh in terms of mana values i think that that they could find some success there because even though i'm still testing Fil filched falcon and I'm, I'm learning a bunch in terms of timing with it it has uh, exceeded my expectations in a lot of ways like it lived up to everything that i thought i wanted it to do but then it was doing things a lot better than i thought uh and i literally i, I will have a game at some point it'll show up on Manny's mtg where i beat a resolved one ring and Narset on the table for like multiple, multiple turns. Like the Narset just never left play after it resolved. And a one ring drew like 20 cards. And you were able to just get and there. it just didn't. <laughs> and it just didn't, it didn't matter because I had uh, my, my engine of being able to recur Phil yeah. Falcon over and over was just effective enough to be like, okay, they have to like point out the removal at these flying birds that I effectively am just going to sack in response and be up those exchanges and the clues can draw cards around a Narset, yeah. which is really cool. And then 
like the the no matter how many cards they draw, if you have this impenetrable uh, recursion of going of Filch Falcon just continuing over and over again to continue making birds, that I was like, oh wow, this is way more resilient than I thought, and I'm like, this is a card that I'm sure people were looking at as draft chafe. And when they test it, if they do, they might be like, oh yeah, this is absolutely draft chafe, but you know, it isn't this other thing that actually is good that, you know, Phil just didn't think about. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of that space that's unexplored because, you know, it's tough to explore it. You kind of got to get, you're you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to take your lumps a little bit to, to find these things out. Right. Um, Yeah, no, I, 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 I think uh, you know that's a that's a good point to cut over to like sort of the second half of our episode. Uh, if you'll indulge me, uh, Phil, uh, you know we've got a couple announcements. Uh, we're gonna start trying to ramp up to two episodes a week, two long form episodes a week, um, and then I'm, I, you know I'll, I'll work in some some uh, shorter features again uh, again as well. But we have have hired uh, a pair of editors to to deal with our uh, with our post production. So we're going to have more episodes uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of that support, uh, a, lot of, a lot of our ability to do that comes from the support of our Patreon uh, su- supporters. Uh, so that allows us to, you know, pay, pay these people a real wage, one, you know, <laughs> something we don't feel, feel terrible about, like having somebody do. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I wanted to say all that, say this, we're, we're passing the savings on to you, uh, dear listener. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure that you guys get a little bit more bang for your buck. Uh, if you're not a Patreon, uh, supporter, you're still going to get all of the, all of the content as well. Uh, if you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, patreon.com slash eternal dirtles, uh, you know, that it, it all goes towards making the show better. As you can see, uh, I'm using, uh, right now, hopefully it works out, uh, my new webcam, which is a brand new, uh, Nikon DSLR. Uh, which I'm going to take to uh, to Vegas to get a lot of content from Vegas. So you know we're, we're using all this to up, to update our oh, Chicago, podcast. Chicago, what's that? Chicago, Chicago. Right? Did I say Vegas? Chicago. I'm going yeah. to Chicago. You guys can go to Vegas. Um, but to, to that end, you know, and I've got the panel. I'm sure you guys have heard me talk endlessly about. We've got this uh, panel there uh, talking about uh, the 30 years of magic media and content creation. Um, there's going to be a ton. Th- and, and look, I'm going to just give. I'm just going to say it. Thanks to Phil and I, there's going to be a ton of legacy stuff at the uh, at, at the convention too, which is pretty great. Like we we sat down with the uh, with the uh, people who run Pastimes, and we hashed out a couple of ideas for them to to use, and they they took our ideas and they ran with them. So I, I'm pretty excited to uh, to go there and actually be able to do something as a legacy player. I'm, um, you know, obviously excited to just see friends and hang out. You know, Honorog's going to be there. Uh, you know, uh, we got uh, Better Days MTG is going to be there. Uh, you know, Joe Dyer is going to be there. I'm going to get to hang out with Joe Dyer. We're going to go. We're going to go get dinner. Uh, Phil is not going to be there. Phil, what are you doing? Yeah, I know. I, th- this is the time where you know the the work of paying bill actual yeah. bills in real life came up and couldn't make it however now that we have talked to the people at past times and like we we've been in conversation with them about like how we can expand uh getting some legacy coverage and uh uh tournaments at these cons which are primarily uh gauged towards like commander players and less so eternal players uh but we had some ideas they took them we're seeing that of all like the fruits of that in this first go and we hope that it will expand they've been uh extremely uh, welcoming yeah. to all of Super the receptive. things that we've pitched them and which is fantastic because it shows that they, they care and they want to do that kind of thing. And, uh, but part of that is because we were able to, you know, get in as content creators at the, at, uh, magic on Vegas that gave us the legitimacy to like sort of talk about that. And that's part of the fact, like from all the support that we've gotten, that's enabled us to ramp yeah. up and, and let's so. not uh, fail to mention, uh, we have a, a new sponsor. We have, of course, we have Moxfield, uh, and you know the, the Moxfield, very dear to my heart, the greatest Magic: The Gathering deck building website of all time. Um, but we also have Tales of Adventure. Uh, Tales of Adventure has just sponsored us. That's going to start in March. But I'll put a link below. Uh, you know Tales of Adventure. Uh, they, 
they sell magic cards. The Eternal lives here. You know, that's their that's their motto. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking about buying cards, if you're thinking about buying Case of the Filch Falcon even, uh, you know, go to the link that we have below and purchase it through through uh, Tales of Adventure. That just shows them that uh, our listeners are the, the type of people that uh, they want they want uh, having us do ads for. You know, uh, I, I try very hard to not have, like, an egregious amount of ads on the cast. And now that Spotify has, has kind of uh, moved away from its ad base, uh, one of the things we're doing to, to sort of get back up there into the, you know, into the point where we can start, you know, outsourcing a little bit so that we can create more content is, is by having these sponsors. And so you supporting these sponsors, using Moxfield, using uh, TOA, one of the great things about TOA is all the cards get sent. It's not like TCG player where you like pick your entire deck out and it comes from like 14 packages. It's one package from directly from TOA. You know the quality is good. You know those guys are looking. You know they're they're grading their cards properly. You you know Mike Caffrey. You know like uh, if you've been to any events, it's the big purple one. You know you know it. Uh, so with that said, uh, we're we're super excited uh, that we we have this new sponsor. Um, we've always been excited about Moxfield. And, um, yeah, I, uh, with that said, I mean, this is a relatively short episode, but, uh, you know, it's the first one that, uh, that, uh, Mike is going to be editing. So, uh, we're going to get, we're going to give him a short one. This should come out on Monday. So I will have been back, uh, uh, from, uh, Chicago by then. I think what we're going to do is try and do Monday and Thursdays for our drops for episodes. We'll see how good we stick to that. But, um. Yeah, there we go. I'm, I'm excited also to see our, our other editor is going to be there. Pit Goblin Battlecaster will will be there. If you haven't checked out his his uh, site, I'll link that below as well. And uh, yeah, that's uh, I think that's it for us this week. Phil, do you want to add anything else? Uh, deduce is the deduce truth. I don't know if it's the about truth. It. You- and Bird is the so, word, dude. So- <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm a big fan of deduce i've been on that that's the truth i also think that at some point we should talk about how at what point are we at the at, at what point are we at the stage where a card that just says or does like some amount of card draw and nothing else right it doesn't gain life it doesn't affect the board it's just some card that says draw some number of cards on it at what point are we getting to where that is a liability, not a, a yeah? Bad. When will they reprint Ancestor Recall and it just is bad? <laughs> in 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 the context of like the world that yeah. we live in, wh- where is it that like you know you know yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, I mean, and, right? and, and Arce and you know there, there's plenty of things. Using the resources is as important as getting them put into your hand. Yeah, I mean, I, I find that like uh, I, the more and more that I play with these cards, I mean, deduce is very good because timing is very good. But I, the the more I played with like anything that just says draw more than one card on, it, I was like, oh, this is bad because these are really night whispers. Yeah, that's a fun. And it's actually I, like I, a night whisper plus two damage on top of the night whisper. You know, right? and it's like you don't really you can't really afford that in a in a world where you don't have sixty yeah. life. So. I don't know. That's future episode. Yeah, maybe on the next one. Anyhow, uh, if you're if you're if you were at uh, Chicago, since this is going to come out after I'm back, uh, it was great meeting you. Everyone, have a great weekend. Have a great week. I suppose it's a week. Uh, thanks for watching. For the gift that keeps on giving all year round, join our Patreon at Patreon.com/EternalDurdles. And hey, check out this. Playlist we got up here with all of our interviews over the last couple of years. Some great people from the Legacy community, some really great guests.